Hello and welcome to part six of my History of Progressive Rock in 60 albums. I'm up till the year 2000 now. Um, I'm not going to try and sort of recap on where we've got. We've got through a lot. Right, but here we are in 2000 and we've got pretty much prog being represented very strongly by prog metal and then all the sort of math rock and gent and all that stuff that is coming after that from prog metal and we've got that we've got this sort of established prog world now which you know uh, buoyed up by the ability to make cds yourself record yourself in your own home studios and then with the advent of digital technologies you know be able to self-release we suddenly have thousands thousands of prog bands and in many cases these prog bands and not doing anything new. They are just regurgitating what the 70s progressive rock bands did, but with modern production values to an audience of middle-aged people who want to just hear the same thing again, you know. So there's that. And then we have this experiment avant-garde aspects that is out there in music, where artists want to take the form of music that they play and extend it. And when they do that, they use progressive rock techniques. Um, so on this list from 2000 to 2009 um, I'm going to be trying to cover all that with albums from all sorts of different you know genres and areas that will represent that as, as much as I possibly can also I'm going to have two albums on this list uh, which I'm playing on now I haven't played these because I'm trying to argue that these are the greatest albums of, of this decade not at all but what it'll do is it'll be able, when I get to these albums, I can talk about my personal um, sort of input and view. Because this is the decade where I go from being a prog fan to being someone who plays on progressive rock albums. And I think in the background somewhere, you can see one of the albums there next to Close to the Edge. I've parked a CD copy of Million Town by Frost, which I played on in 2006, and that will be the album that re represents the year 2006. But let's go back to the year 2000. What have we got to represent that? Well, in the 1990s, one of the biggest progressive rock albums of that decade, as far as I'm concerned, was OK Computer by Radiohead. And this is where, you know, the sort of post-grunge, post-rock, and then the sort of dance music, electronica, Aphex Twin World all came together on an album that sold absolutely millions of the critics then hailed as being one of the greatest albums that ever made and it went, you know, had huge fan base. That's an out and out progressive rock album. I put it on the other day, it's an out and out progressive rock album. And so here's an example where prog can still come up with the goods in the 90s, it still comes up with the goods. Um, in 2000, um, Radiohead release Kid A and I think Kid A they go deeper into that sort of whole electronica territory um, this is a mainstream rock band making an exper experimental progressive rock Outer Limits album and so I'm representing the Outer Limits here which previously I've represented by Mr Bungle I've represented by Cardiacs this is something that we have to champion and here we have a mainstream band and this album sold a lot of copies and that's what I've got opening up 2000. Now, um, for 2001, I've got Lateralist by Tool. Tool are the products of that whole thrash metal, progressive metal, technical metal, um, progressive rock approach. Um, that I think for many people who are prog fans bands like Tool are at the top you know Dream Theatre Tool Porcupine Tree for the modern prog listener I think these are the big classical classic prog bands of our time um, and at, for in, in 2002 we see the, the release of In Absentia by Porcupine Tree um, and Porcupine Tree again are one of those bands so these become in the 2000s the contemporary prog bands bands like Tool and Porcupine Tree um, when I come into making prog these are the albums these are the bands that, and albums that are on the scene at that time 
Let's look at Porcupine Tree. So Porcupine Tree actually emerged in the mid 90s and they start off as almost like an art pop band following on in the sort of wake of the sort of art pop that's been made by 80s bands like Japan. Uh, Porcupine Tree actually contains the keyboardist of Japan, I mean, you know, Richard Barbieri. They're teaming up with Steve Wilson, who's a young, you know, sort of guitarist, singer, songwriter who's very interested in production, uh, that has grown up listening to lots of prog, but also lots of other music as well. And they, they, Porcupine Tree start off by making the claim that they're not a prog band. Um, they're very art, art rock to start off with. But as they go on, they they ally themselves with this sort of progressive metal thing. Although I wouldn't class them as progressive metal, they ally themselves alongside that. They have a very strong relationship with the the uh, the, the metal band Opeth, right? Which sort of then I think they start to get perceived by the audience for that in the same way. Back in at this point, um, they are really trying to make the argument that they're not prog and Steve Wilson saying a lot of anti-prog things in the press at that time. I remember this around about 2005. I also remember the sort of mainstream prog world in the two, early 2000s. They didn't like Porcupine Tree. They had their own niche sort of fan base. In 2002, they bring out In Absentia with Gavin Harrison on drums, Chris Maitland's gone. And I feel with this album, they sort of, there's a, an upscale they seem to grab more the market at that point you know this is going to be followed by dead wing where they've got like guests from i think agent baloo and alex lifeson i think's on that album and that that also then they, they're starting to 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 now create their own little world and there's so many bands like this i think tall and porcupine tree you know over the last 20 years have, have emerged as being mainstream prog this is what we've got going on here and in absentia is where we see that in 2002 and now 2003 we have another band that is occupying a similar territory and that's mars volta with d Loust in the comatorium um what are these what are all these bands they're sort of they're they're basically metal bands they're progressive metal bands and and the idea of what progressive metal is is widening all the time you know mars volta have got a sort of um, avant rock approach I suppose there's elements of a lot of the sort of post grunge bands you know post sand garden bands you know that emerged um, and there's elements of punk in there although the there's instrumental virtuosity is incredible level right um, there's a darkness that's emerged in progressive rock there, there, there's not necessarily a the the the, the when you go back to the classic progressive rock of the 70s, that darkness is not there. A lot of it is very whimsical. Like I think Van de Graaff generated the band that bring in that darkness. And then they're followed in by um, King Crimson with the Bill Bruford, John Wett and Lark's Tongue in the Aspic period. This is where we see this heavy darkness emerging. And this element is now really emerging to main scene progressive rock. That, for most people in the early 2000s, is what is pulling all these bands together it's king crimson isn't it it's van de graaff generating king crimson especially king crimson tall porcupine tree mars volta you know are all coming out of that world and that's what i've got representing the early 2000s um for 2004 i've um i've chosen dark matter by iq it it was a big album at the time in the prog world um and again this is IQ. IQ have always had that darkness in there, but they get even darker with this album. Um, and this is where I come in. All right, so um, those of you who don't know, watch this through. Is that um, originally I was the drummer with Robert Plant. I played for Robert Plant for two years. I, I left his band in uh, 2000 at the beginning of this decade. And in 2001, I was playing with the blues guitarist Ian Parker and touring Europe with him. I was also picking up bits of world, bits of work on the blue scene with AZ Lister and did a couple of gigs with Joe Shaw Taylor. I'm playing on the blue scene. I'm not happy on the blue scene. I'm a big jazz fusion and progressive rock fan. And through um, a friend of mine, I hear that IQ have just released this album, 
dark matter. They're about to go on tour and they need a drummer. And so I ring up for an audition and I go and check out this album. Now for me, Dark Matter, when I bought this, was the first time I'd ed listened to anything from the modern progressive rock world. Because personally, I was a huge fan of the classic 70s progressive rock uh, bands when I was a kid. I then discovered Jazz Fusion. And then through Jazz Fusion, I explored these progressive rock tendencies through a whole host of bands, which I've been covering on this list. You know, um, so through the 90s, I was listening to things like Square Pusher, Goldie, um, loads of hip hop, avant-garde electronica. You know, that's what I'm listening to throughout the 90s. I haven't got a clue about all these these new progressive rock bands. I'm not listening to Tool or Porcupine Tree or Spock's Beard or any of these bands. But I know IQ because I'm, I was aware of the neo-prog movement, that which, is, which was a movement that had emerged when I was 15 years old. And I was really aware of it. And I checked those bands out. I didn't like Meridian. Um, I liked Palace and I liked IQ. They, were, they seemed much more virtuoso and much more exciting. So that I, I was like, oh my God, the IQ, that's, that's going to be a great gig. So I go and check out Dark Matter. I go and buy it. And I put it on and I thought it was an absolute masterpiece. And it, it, it didn't fall into... It, yeah, IQ do not push the boundaries of prog. And the thing is, they knowingly don't do this because I was in IQ. Um, <clears throat> the influences coming into that band at that time were so wide, you know. Um, so, for example, John Jowett was a, is a big fan of, of bands like Killing Joke. He's a big fan of uh, bands like King's X. Um, I came in as a huge jazz fusion band, fan listening to all this sort of hip hop and all this uh, neo soul and electronica. Uh, Mike it was into uh, house music. And that's when I joined the band, was actually going out and DJing and was listening to sort of all sorts of different things. A huge Steely Dan fan. Mike's huge. So all those influences there, but I was very aware that IQ is about updating the sort of classic prog ideas from bands like Yes and Genesis, updating it culturally and technically production-wise. When I put on Dark Matter, I, I feel that this is an absolutely fantastic album. And although there's so many bands out there that are now within the world of prog peddling this sort of revisionist view of prog, that can be done really well. And I feel that Dark Matter is an example of that. And a lot of the uh, push in the envelope is, is, is using the studio technology, I think, to just push the envelope in terms of sampling and, and just using digital technologies to shape the music. Um, I think this has become, it will be the death of prog in the end, is, is unless people just take their foot off that perfectionism pedal in the studio we're just going to end up with something that's got nothing to do with humanity whatsoever anyway that's moving forward so um 2004 i'm now a member of iq and i'm off on tour touring this album dark matter around the world so i'm having to play it although so i didn't play on the album but obviously doing the the um dark matter it was called uh, doing that tour and going over to uh, the States and I ended up playing um, at um, Near Fest which we headlined and that was filmed for a DVD so a lot of the sort of uh, footage out there on YouTube of IQ playing the songs off this album is me drumming on it. These these songs were very important to me. I had to learn like Sacred Sound, I had to learn the huge harvest of souls you know. Uh, I, had, I think I had two weeks to learn that and then I was out on stage in, in Montreal playing it with them. So this is a period where I come in and that's why it's totally personal. But I, when I uh, looked up at the albums coming out in 2004, Dark Matter is really high, highly regarded by the prog fans and is re representing that, that world of prog that exists now. Now outside of that... There's artists that are making prog albums. In 2005, Pat Metheny made the album The Way Up. And I've put this on this list because this is an hour and 10 minute single through composed track. It's an absolute masterpiece of progressive rock um, approach. Um, and so this is where I come in and I can remember carrying this album with me 
this Pat Metheny album and telling all the people in the prog world, you've got to listen to Pat Metheny, which of course they weren't listening to because they were listening to like Anathema or Opeth or Porcupine Tree. This is, this is the world I came into. Um, feeling sort of a part of it, but also not a part of it as well because I wasn't up on this huge progressive rock world. You know, I can remember turning up at um, Neafest and a year later I played Rosfest and there's all these bands on and they're huge bands in the progressive rock world you know the bands I'm talking about um, that's the world I end to so um, I started working on an album with IQ but it actually took um, four years to make that album uh, I then get a call by off Jem Godfrey to get involved in this album Million Town by a new band Frost and I hear it and I've suddenly become aware of all this, these bands that are on the scene and I hear the demos for this album and I went this guy has taken all those neo prog ideas and all those classic prog ideas and he's also taken it and melded it with um, pop influences and electronica influences um, and he's put all that together into what I felt was a quite a genre defining album which is Million Town, and I just jumped at the fact of playing on this, and I spent, you know, a, a couple of days down at uh, John Mitchell's studio, the outhouse studios down in Reading, uh, putting the drums down on this album. For various reasons, my drums were very compromised on Million Town. I had no idea about how digital technologies worked and how, you know, albums were made it was quite a shock you know there's elements of my drumming on that album on Million Town but on the whole those drums are programmed it's uh, uh, as is a lot of the stuff on that album and that that was a shock to me um, and I am saying this publicly here that this was a shock to the point where in 2019 2009 um, I settled down, I got a family and I got a full-time job in, in a college. But I also consciously stepped out of the prog world because I found the use of computers, the use of quantization, of re-triggering, of resampling, of going into takes and editing them endlessly and sculpting them in Pro Tools until they are absolutely perfect, seemed to me to be an anathema, to quote one of these modern prog bands, to what the ideals of prog were. I found that really difficult. Uh, at the same time, 2006, I think Million Town is a brilliant album. I think Jem's a genius and what he pulls off on that album is a work of genius. And I think the album did genuinely change the history of prog, this little history that we're in. Not mainly mainstream music, but I think in terms of, you know, this little prog world that we now exist in, this little bubble of prog, it did have an effect, you know. Uh, uh, but I also, this is the emergence of my realisation that I I'm, was not that type of musician. Maybe I'm just not good enough to play prog, you know. Maybe I, I just can't play in time enough or whatever, I don't know what it is, you know. But I, 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 I something emerged in me at this point where I really started to dislike prog and the perfectionism that was apparent in the prog world, right? The, the dishonesty. I'm not saying that Million Town was, but there, there's definitely the case that the way that albums have been produced at that time, that's a personal thing. This is my personal thing I bring into this history here. 2007 saw the release of Fear of a Blank Planet by Porcupine Tree. It's almost like their swung song. They have, they have reformed and made another album, but this was the, their last album. And when Steve Wilson then changed tack and went from saying he wasn't a prog artist that he, to he was a prog artist and he brings out the incredible some incredible albums that i'm going to talk about in a minute when i get onto the next decade but that's the that was the album and for me when i was making prog back in the late 2000s fear of blank planet was a touchstone album for me of of what we were trying to do i think it was absolutely a genre changing album in 2008 i heard vlomjud by moon safari so a lot of the prog albums I'm hearing on this new scene I'm in, in this prog bubble, let's call it the prog bubble, right? And which is what we're really dealing with here. Um, they were okay. I wasn't overly impressed. And I wasn't impressed because some of it, most of it sounded like just regurgitations of prog bands from the 70s. 
With New Moon Safari, I heard an album which was out and out prog, was not trying to reinvent the wheel, was not going down the avant-garde route, but for me was completely refreshing. And I think the thing I loved about it was the um, incredible virtuoso vocals and the way they'd in integrated an almost like pop element, melodic pop element into heavy prog. And I realised that was something I really loved about Jethro Tull and Yes and Genesis. That was one of the things I loved about it. And he planted a seed in my head, which will emerge as these videos carry on, you know. So, um, eventually, in 2009, the album that I'd been working on for IQ for... Um, years and years finally got finished um my drums were recorded around about 2008 2009 after a four-year period of writing this stuff i was involved unlike million town i was involved in the writing of frequency um most of the album was created by jamming in the studio the process had been actually very stressful and and it, and it ended up with you know martin alford the keyboard player leaving. I was actually at the session where that all broke down and Martin just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, Martin was work, working on um, his own solo album, which I also played on at the time. Uh, so I'm heavily involved in the prog world at this point. Um, Frequency, I can remember, we'd recorded the first track Frequency on the album. I'd recorded the drums and as I'd finished it, as I walked out, um, they just automatically went for the quantization button and i said what are you doing you know they said we're quantizing it. i said why it's, i thought my drum was all in time like oh, oh yeah it was all right but we we just do this as a standard thing and i was like horrified by this and i fought i fought for it and um if you listen to um frequency although there's a lot of editing on that and there's hundreds of takes and they tended to take I, i'm not keen on assembling parts out of takes I go that bar's perfect and that bar let's put them together and that fill doesn't ruffle any edges to put that so so a lot of that went on on frequency but um it, it, but it's my real drumming and i i persuaded them i don't think they quantize they might have shifted a few mistakes around even there but i think they eased off on the quantization um lever <laughs> in the studio i made freaks and i'm pretty proud of my drum performance on frequency i'm very proud of that album and that's what I finished this decade with in 2009. But for me, me coming back into this prog world, this prog bubble, which doesn't include people like Cardiacs, that doesn't include Goldie or Aphex Twin or Radiohead, it's, that's not part of it. It's this prog bubble at the peak top as Porcupine Tree, as Tool, it has uh, Dream Theatre. And then underneath there's a whole bunch of middle-level bands um, which I was involved with, those are the bands I was involved with. I'd had my fill of it and I am using this history to expose that and this is why you don't hear me discussing so much modern prog on this channel. It's because I don't listen to it and I've got a history with it and I find it difficult to stomach, you know, um, bands that are basically just regurgitating their idea of what progressive rock is, which is basically Genesis or Pink Floyd, right? In this prog bubble, nobody sounds like Gong. Nobody sounds like Can or Magma. Nobody sounds like Hatfield in the North. They sound like Genesis, maybe a little bit of Yes and Pink Floyd. Touch of Jethro Tull. It's, it's become an established genre. This is what it is, and this is the big problem. I've tried to define what prog is at the beginning of this series, but uh, I didn't mention the word innovation, and I accept that something can be prog and not be innovative, and have not progressed. But we have two ideas going forward now that has established itself by this point in the prog history. We have the idea of being progressive, and that's the progressive way is where you take rock music or you take that form of music, it could be dance music or hip hop, and you ex expand the boundaries of it. And you expand the boundaries using technology, using your own personal experience, using instrumental virtuosity, expanding the rhythms, expanding the song form, all those ideas which you can take and open something out 
that's progressive music, progressive rock if you like. Then we have prog the genre and prog the genre is basically peddling the sounds that were pioneered by certain 70s prog bands and basically using modern production methods to, to um, package that up to a, an audience today which is predominantly a middle-aged audience that grew up with those bands and want to hear it in another form. There's nothing wrong with that. You see, there's nothing wrong with doing any of this, but we have prog and we have progressive. Those are the two things. And that's where we're at at the end of this video. And I hope I, in this history, I've been able to show how those progressive tendencies that, that carried on all the way through the nineties and actually produced really credibly groundbreaking albums right up to, you know, things like Radiohead where the progressive DNA is still there. By the time we get to the 2000s, we see a change. Now, a lot of that change has come, has come from the advent of digital technologies. Now bands can self-release. You don't need a major label and you don't need a major label to make albums. But the problem with prog is, is the, the people who make prog, personality-wise, are the same people that have a very good handle on technology. So, um, so many computer programmers right are also prog fans so we see a huge amount of prog made by that type of psychology right the weekend warrior this person who has a good job in it and then it, it, you know at the weekend they join their band and they get in their little bedroom studio and they assemble using computers albums that sound like 70s progressive rock bands with immaculate production and the problem is is that element of perfectionism which is key because I've, I've argued elsewhere art is the um, marriage of hedonism right a visceral hedonism the thing that makes rock and roll rock and roll that and then perfectionism which is instrumental virtuosity is that adherence to the grid is, is intellectual you know, uh, uh, structures, all that stuff. When those are in perfect harmony, which you get with the great prog, it creates great art. But the problem is, is that progressive rock is all about that hedonism being advanced through perfectionism. And so the people who are good at it tend to have an all, almost OCD um, attraction towards perfectionism. You mix that with the ability to self-release and the ability to sculpt music into absolute perfect examples of progressive rock. And we have the thing that undermines all the bands out there, right? And this is why I don't talk about it, right? I feel with so many modern progressive rock bands, if you could just go in and mess it up a little bit, right? If you could just hear some heart and soul, we could hear some people not knowing what they're doing it would be so much better but i'm now ranting about the state of progressive rock now because in the next video we'll be coming right up until the next the the present day something i haven't talked about at all on this channel so i hope you get ready for this so i'll see you on the next video i'm going to say if you like this then like it if you want to subscribe subscribe uh, ring the notification bell if you want to hear about the next video and uh, if you want to support me doing this stuff there's a patreon down below so go and support me and thanks for watching and i'll see you on the next video thank you very much